Ready? Um, so welcome to the first Atelier de la Bioéthique of this academic year, hosted by the uh, um, Ethics and Health Branch of the CRE. And we have the pleasure of hosting today Silke Schichtens. Mm -hmm. um, and she's a full professor at the Department of Medical Ethics and History of Medicine at the University Medical Center Göttingen. She has a very long bio, so I will let you say a few words about yourself. But I just want to say that she held various um, research positions. Uh, she was an adjunct professor at San Francisco State University. She was visiting research scholar at uh, Berkeley, she also in Delhi, Tel Aviv, Lancaster. She's been around the world, and currently she's a visiting research scholar at the University of Montreal, collaborating with Professor Annette Leibing. Uh, she also recently published a book about uh, surrogacy in the international context, so we may have you back again to talk about that. Okay. But today she will be talking about patient representation. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great. Thank you very much for having me here. It's really a great pleasure. Um, as Radit just mentioned, I'm here for two and a half months research stay because I'm working with Annette Leiden, she's a medical anthropologist here at the university and we both have a long-standing interest in issues around dementia. And um, today I won't talk so much about dementia, but dementia patients or patients with dementia and the way how they are represented in a couple of health um, policy issues was kind of an initiative and, and a driving research question that also brought me to the topic today I want to talk about. So the, the talk is thought to be very broad in the sense that I want to address some normative and epistemological challenges regarding patient representation and it seems like many of you working on this and so I'm, I'm really curious to hear your feedback and your thoughts about that. Perhaps I should say a bit more about my, my general research motivation. We just had a short <laughs> chat about the specificities of the German bioethics debate or, or discourse or, or academia. And I think in Germany it's very common to have a more clinical focus normally in bioethics. I myself, um, from the beginning, I was always interested in, in the interrelation, so to say, between the individual and the social perspective, and I also have a strong interest in political ethical questions. Um, and also, and during my early postdoc, I met so many social scientists and medical anthropologists, I was immediately drawn into the fact that also cultural attitudes uh, which are often more hidden or explicitly um, provide a, a framework how values and interests are um, prioritized that I, I, so to say, also start to bring in this perspective and that's why I have also these many collaborations that internationally has something to do with my interest in doing comparative research in bioethics. So, so this whole mutual relationship is often driven by one main idea, and that's the idea to bring in the patients or the public perspective. Given the fact that, to my understanding, the healthcare um, and medical discourses are still very expert-dominated discourses. I mean, we can question that, but I think um, a lot of people would <coughs> perhaps agree with that observation. A second point is, as I already said, is this question how bioethical reflect, reflection, that means our own scholars' work, is somehow embedded in the cultural framework. Um, being a German, having worked in the US, in India, in the UK, in Israel, I can tell you, it's, uh, it's uh, really impressive to see how our own mindset, so to say, is framed by, by cultural values. We, at least in the beginning, often don't question, and those of you who have perhaps immigrated to Canada know this very well too. So today I will want to focus on two questions, which um, some are of course informed by these research motivations, and the first is an idea that I'm so not so much interested in patients as individuals, but also how they act as a collective. And in general, I'm interested in the idea of what collectivity means in ethics. Um, and the second point is then the question of representation. Representation is, in, from a political ethical perspective, a core principle. I mean, that's all 
about uh, how um, modern democracies and, and politics work about. So the question of who can represent whom and on behalf of what kind of justification, I think, is a very uh, crucial one. <coughs> and so what I want to do today is, so that's a bit my agenda. First, I want to give you a kind of background assumption, which will be more theoretical, <coughs> where I think um, what is tricky about collective representation, but why it's also very important. Uh, to think about it, and I want to challenge. I mean, to point a bit on the challenge of particular patient groups like dementia or autism or everything that's sort of say related with mental health issues, and bring in very few insights from an empirical study I conducted with Israeli colleagues, where we uh, did uh, interviews with patient organizations in Germany and Israel with patients um, or organizations who represent dementia and or um, autism. And I will then end with a few implications, hopefully, that are sufficiently for a nice discussion we can have afterwards. Okay, I think the first question is perhaps why patient representation as all is very important. And there are a couple of documents, and if, you, if we think about patient representation, what do we have in mind, or at least what do I have in mind? I can think of a lot of concrete opportunities, and whether they are part of new research projects, I think there's this whole idea of having what some would call PPI, like patient public participation and involvement, or public engagement, uh, so that they're part of research projects, they can be part of research um, <coughs> um, review boards, for example, in the, NI, uh, in the UK, the NIH often has a kind of mandatory uh, request of having patients be involved in assessing new um, technologies. Um, and for example, in Germany, that was quite a revolution, I would say. Uh, since 10, almost 10 years, um, patient representatives are also part of the most important, I would say, most important um, board in Germany that decides what is, so to say, in the basket, uh, what is paid publicly by public health insurances and not. They have no voting rights in these committees. They have so-called, um, um, yeah, how do you say, advice rights. But still it was kind of a revolution to have patients on this board and before there were only doctors and uh, representatives of health insurance companies or all systems. Um, I'm not sure how it's in Canada, the quick dirty search I did, I found that there is this patient um, safety institute, for example, who seems to be very strong behind the idea of PPI, but I'm not sure whether they see it as mandatory or whether it's more informal and perhaps you know more and can inform me about that. So I think it's quite unquestionable and also the European Funding agencies, for example, to put a lot of effort in uh, stressing the fact that nowadays you should have patient representatives on your research project, for example. Um, and of course, there's also one very important document from the WHO, um, almost now um, 20 years uh, old, uh, even older. Uh, that's a declaration of patient rights. And there they own, not only claim individual rights of patients, but also collective rights to be meant to be heard on the different levels of health policy making. And if we look back, what happened since the 90, mid-90s until today, I think we can still observe that in many countries this um, representation of patient collective rights is often rather informal, it's not very structured and it's often not a legal requirement within health politics. So an ethicist, I would say, I think there are quite strong uh, claims behind this idea and we may need first to understand why it's not put into practice, but we also still need to understand and perhaps convince more people uh, why it would be worse to work on these collective rights. So the question of justification seems to be very crucial here. And in the following, I will just summarize an uh, arguments I made earlier where I tried to bring together two, three strands of argumentation or justification. 
which in particular, um, so to say, <coughs> argue why it's important to have um, patient represented um, in, in a very general justification. So the first idea is what was brought forward by a couple of medical sociologists, feminist epistemologists, and that's the idea that patients have a particular experience, whether it's embodied experience um, or situated knowledge, we use a term from Donna Haraway, which is very particular and when, which we, so to say, need to recognize that it cannot be easily brought in by somebody else. Um, which is, I think, for a lot of medical sociologists or doctors quite um, a challenge because that's what they often do. I mean, they normally provide this perspective. But still, I think there is the idea that there might be particular experience um, that cannot be easily, so to say, translated and that therefore it's very important to have um, this experience directly um, involved in the process. Uh, in Germany, we have a term Betroffenheit, uh, it's being affected. I just saw there was, a, even here in Montreal, a, a dance performance which called Betroffenheit because it's a really interesting <laughs> term. And it has a lot of to say about the idea of being affected in the sense that but being affected and um, um, I think the English meaning mainly means that there is an intersubjective relationship um, between a negative state of affair and a person, but it also means in the, in the German um, pronunciation, it means also that we have a kind of empathy with what happened to somebody. So it has a kind of a double meaning, and I think this is a kind of point I'd like to make that we also realize that, um, that this is quite a particular experience people have. For example, having experienced a particular illness, and therefore, we show particular empathy to give them their own voice. Um, and as I said, I think it's normally ex embodied experience which is lacking professionals. However, I do not claim that's totally impossible, so to say, to be knowledge that cannot be brought in by others. However, there's a second argument, and that the second argument that comes in is um, based on, I think, two, two insights. The first is that patients are not only individuals, but they do act, I think, at least since the 70s, since we have a social health movement. They do act also as a social group, and for them, it's a very important experience to be part of a collective. And, and they create also collective social identities. I mean, think about, I mean, Stephen Epstein's work about um, HIV and, and um, the AIDS activists, for example, and how this has really tremendously changed the way how uh, HIV is now treated and also what is uh, with well, quite controversial ways, but still I think it's a very important point. The second um, argument is that their contribution of this, this collectives um, has to be understood under a particular categorization that, that these groups are often socially marginalized. Uh, and I'm referring here to the work of Melissa Williams, Canadian too. Uh, I really appreciate her early work on the voice, trust and memory and the quest of political representation. And I think what she writes there, which is mainly about uh, women rights <laughs> and uh, also rights of uh, African American um, people, for example, I think a lot of things can be transferred to patients too. Because patients also, I think this is not a group, a social identity you choose voluntarily. And it's, it's socially also normally um, uh, has a negative meaning. And, and it's a social group which is normally stigmatized or at least in some ways excluded. So for these groups, as Williams uh, make a good point, it's very important to be represented by themselves and not by others. And that's where trust, for example, comes in. That they trust more their own people um, than they would trust somebody else. <clears throat> and I think a lot of feminists do know what I mean. And the third um, argument that comes from the work of Miranda Fricker a uh, British philosopher who I think very 
smartly in connected these debates about um, social epistemology and the way how debates are structured and how power relations <coughs> um, form our understanding of what is accepted or credible knowledge and what not. So for Frico, there are many discourses, and I think the science discourse is, to my understanding, a very good example, or the health discourse, uh, there exists so-called or the epistemic injustice. And this means that for some, um, some presenters get um, automatically less credibility what they say because there exist social stereotypes. So historically, you can say when women made a point, it wasn't, at least hopefully in the past, uh, seen as less credible because they are so emotional, for example, and so you don't know whether you can really trust them or whether the testimony they gave is really trustful. Or think of Lee Harper's um, story about the, um, what's the mockingbird? The, um, yeah, Kill the Mockingbird, the story about whether, for example, a small boy with black African back, um, um, or African American background can be seen as a trustful witness in the court. So it's, it's, this is the whole idea. And I think with patients, for example, like a very common um, social stereotype when patient representatives talk or meetings is Okay, whatever they say, you know, it's just paid by the pharma industry. I think that's a very common stereotype I heard. And it might be true for some patient organizations that they are on the pay list. But it's definitely not true for all patient organizations. So it, if you want to make this critical point, I think you have to do your, your proper search before you, so to say, apply it. Um, and it's not a general um, justification or that they are too emotional about their illness and so on and so on. And the third argument uh, comes from political ethical theories. I am personally perhaps have a particular favor on this is uh, like coming from tradition, traditions of discourse ethics and, and deliberative ethics. And I mean, but still, as a liberal um, traditions in, in the face of John Stuart Mill, they would always say the best thing, uh, if what what we can do in decision making is that those who who make the decision and those who have to take the result of the decision should be the same person. So the whole idea that somebody else make a decision for you, I mean, that's normally criticized as a problematic form of heteronomy. Uh, normative, heteronormative. Okay, you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the whole idea thing we would find in modern liberal um, politic, political ethics is the idea that self determination is better than being determined by, by somebody else. So that's a very simple argument, and you would find it along of different ethical theories. Um, however, I mean, there can be, it can be said, okay, what are the limits to self-representation? It can be capacity. Here we come to the question whether patients have always the capacity. Or another critique is that they are very partial. And I think that's, that's a Habermasian argument or what all the other deliberative ethicists always are concerned about if people are really interested in a real discourse. That would be kind of the condition and that they are able to transcend, so to say, their own view and would be willing to listen to the better argument. Um, political philosophers like Jane, Jane Manchester, for example, have pointed out still it's, for, it's as such not problematic to bring in your own self-interests, for example, in a political discourse. That's what our interest groups are about. And in this sense, it's more pragmatic criticism of the super idea of Habermas in discourse, perhaps, and to see how real politics are working. I mean, real politics always works that we have self-interest, um, whether it's by this group or another, that we are brought in. And the question is then how the procedure is organized and whether it allows for a fair um, weighing of different arguments. Okay, that was the... This point. So all three together, I would say, bring a very or, or provide a very strong argument or justification to consider representation of patients very seriously. So that's 
the ethical presumption. Now the critical question is how to do this representation because it's obvious clear that um, not everybody can always share in all discourses so who are who is a good representative. And in political philosophy there exist two models of I mean, ideal model, so to say, of representation. The one goes even back to John Stuart Mill, and that's the so-called delegate model of representation. And here the idea is that the representative is always bound to the collective will, or if there was a majority opinion, then he or she has to be bound to this majority opinion. <clears throat> and it, of course, would require that there is always a close internal um, consultation or deliberation within the group to make sure that the representative is always close to this collective vote. Another model, which we will also find very often in politics and other areas, that's, that's the so-called trustee model that was, for example, suggested by another political scientist, Edmund Burke. For Burke, <coughs> it can be wise and, and make sense, that we have perhaps representatives who have a particular leadership and political wisdom and to give them some kind of trust that they can negotiate in concrete political debates, for example. Um, and I think in the practice we will find often a mixture between both types. Um, but you might also realize that there are already political ideologies behind the idea of what is the best type of representative. At least in Germany, I think different parties would have different understanding what is a good um, model for their political um, opinion. So, so my assumption here is that patient organizations, they represent a collective of patients and they can contribute to more epistemic justice. In a dominated healthcare, in an expert-dominated healthcare policy, and also LC debates, but still the question is which model of representation is best, and what, so to say, are the challenges between these models? And this question, I mean, that's uh, unfortunately the only pitch I found for this type of theoretical talk. But I think it also expresses a bit ironically what we often observe in our areas that. Experts are often happy to speak on behalf of somebody else, but the question is do they really have the experience or even a um, representative mandate? So the challenge with patients especially occurs when we consider those patients who have, who might be seen as having some kind of limitations in, in representation. And dementia patients or patients with dementia it's often to be thought that they might have cognitive or communicative uh, limitations to, to pay, take part in political or health political decisions. They might also have a limited economical resources, that's what we also found in our studies. Many patient organizations have very limited um, resources and the, health, and the political system is often not willing, so to say, to give more credit to that. And there is also, of course, a history of legal and practical incapacitation of demanded persons. And another fact is a uh, result of our own studies that many patient organizations that do exist in the field of dementia are dominated by caretakers or by professionals. And this, so to say, brought us to this particular question. Um, is it automatically a problem that uh, these patient organizations, for example, are dominated by caretakers? Um, can they still be seen as a collective representative? And overall, so to say, this raises the question, is self-representation always the better form of good representation? And, and this brings me to a third question that um, can perhaps also discuss, in the vision of a lot of new technologies, who counts as a patient? Because we are also on shifting margins in a lot of areas, having more and more biomarkers, having more and more genetic testing. So it's an, another problem: who is a patient, and, and what sort of say constitutes uh, somebody um, to be classified as that? Okay. The second part is about the empirical ethical insights. I will go over this quite um, more briefly. 
as I said, it was a study we conducted um, in collaboration with Abiyat Bras his, and, and, and his colleagues. He's a social scientist at Beersheba, uh, long-standing, um, very productive collaboration with him. And we, what we did, we were interested in how patient organizations representing patients with dementia and um, persons with autism um, in Germany and Israel and how they see themselves in this whole play about health politics, ongoing bioethical debates about guardianship, for example, um, advanced care directives and so on. And we composed the whole study in a way that it would allow us also to compare the materials so we were using more or less similar questionnaires and also trying to get always um, a broad range of office holders and members of these patient organizations. And most of the stuff is already published um, by, by papers of us. So I think what is more interesting here that um, or, or one very interesting find was that Apart the fact that we found um, the rice groups in Germany and Israel who represent these um, patients, especially when I'm here talking now about patients with dementia, they shared a lot of themes and they had a lot of sort of shared interest why they do this kind of advocacy. So first of all is fighting social stigma. So here we come again in the empirical finding that social marginalization is indeed a point for patients. Uh, and at least in this field, and it's true that like dementia is often what is currently I think seen as one of the still very much stigmatized um, illnesses compared to others. So for all of these patient organizations, it was very important to to increase or to fight for social acceptance of um, patients to be seen as a citizen, to be seen as a full human being, and think about the philosophers' debates about that the demented person has no personhood at all anymore, for example. Um, and of course they were also fighting for, for better treatment options, which is in dementia uh, still an issue. The second point, which I also found interesting, is to see patient organizations in this field uh, as a kind of balancing the loss of individual autonomy, but having, so to say, collective autonomy, collective agency can help patients who see themselves being more and more voiceless, not only because of the social um, system, but also because of the illness. And um, where you see this in practice is that many of these patient organizations were very much involved in both countries in uh, legal debates over guardianship and advanced care directives where they understood this engagement with these debates giving patients themselves more rights like using advanced or legal tools to um, to ensure that the the rights of these patients are ensured even if they are aware that the family might be also trustful but still to have these opportunities a, th a third point was that for all patient organizations working in this field, it was unquestionable that if we talk about this illness, it's not only about the individual patient, it always also um, addresses the whole family. Uh, that was clear for caretakers and patients. But it was already uh, mentioned by caretakers in interviews as well by patients in the interviews that there is, of course, a risk, and there's kind of tension, so to say, where to put the focus on. But at least we found it, um, how to say, uh, a step forward that, uh, that there was an increasing self-awareness about this tension in these patient organizations. And what they also share, uh, all share these patient organizations, is a biomedical model of dementia. I'm stressing this because this is very different to what we found in the interviews um, um, when we talked about um, patient organi or organizations who want to represent persons with autism, there is more divide because um, there are groups who definitely would deny the idea that autism is a disease or illness 
And in this sense, it's, it's not even the label patient organization itself comes, becomes a bit problematic, but we use it more for pragmatic terms. Okay, and then uh, what is perhaps also interesting is what we observed in Germany is that there's a new trend, and that's a trend we would find also in a few other European countries. We did not find it in Israel, that there is now a split. There's a split within the landscape of patient organizations, who, those who claim that they represent pa patients with dementia themselves. So these are patient organizations of uh, patients with dementia, and there were patient organizations for patients with dementia, which were normally uh, led by caretakers or professionals. And where, so we also found differences in the way where they put their gender and how they act. So this often for split. For example, with regard to the public awareness of dementia, so what would be their agenda? For the, for the patient organizations, for, um, it's often more important to, to present a, a, have the holistic approach, which means to integrate the medical and the social. While the off-patient organization we interviewed, they stress uh, that for them, I think the main aim is to, the, whether it's by technological means or whatever, to, to, um, to stress or to increase the agency and independency of the individual patient. So it was not so much about dementia-friendly communities, for example, uh, but they, they would put their priorities, for example, in having new smart houses that allow individuals to live for on their own, along, longer on their own. And I mean, these are interesting, I think, differences to see where to put priorities when it comes to health policy decision making. The second question was, and here we come back to our representative um, model, that they were quite aware that there is a difference between the trustee model and the delegate model, and that at least the off-patient organization favored um, this idea of self-representation and the delegate model, including the fact that on a po acting on a political level can be then a bit more tricky for these representatives, because they always have to go back to their community and see, okay, there's this new proposal, how do we deal now with this? While the trustee model, of course, allows much more flexibility in, in political uh, negotiations. And it was also clear that this intra-family relationship was seen in, in a bit different ways. So the patient organization for, they often idealized family members as a trustee, and that there was no alternative uh, as the family member. And they put the family member perhaps more in contrast to the professionals and the doctors. Um, while the off uh, patient organizations at least were pointing out that there are a couple of conflicts when, when it comes to physicians, whether it's that um, patients feel that their caretakers taking over, so to say, limit their own decision range, um, um, would be more on an everyday level, perhaps not so much on the political level. What we found interesting is, and, and that's perhaps a new development, I think that also the split of these patient organizations we observed in Germany, I think is a result also of new developments in diagnostics and dementia. Because in the last 10 years, there are a lot of more technologies around that allow much earlier detection of dementia than it was 10, 20 years ago. So this whole idea about having new biomarker technology, having early diagnostic tools available creates also a new, uh, new category of patients who are still high functioning in a sense. While normally dementia or pa persons with dementia are associated only in the very late stage. But this new understanding of seeing dementia as something that's on a large spectrum of trajectory um, Changes, of course, other than the landscape, who can be politically active, who can raise his voice, and so on. 
And that, that's, a, I think, a finding that might be also interesting for other areas where we think that there is the blurring line between patients who are symptomatic and asymptomatic, but then the question is so to say what is their, and their capacity to brought in, uh, in the discourse are much better, but on the other hand you can question are they still, are they already in this, do they already so to say, have this particular embodied experience we are so much interested in. So again, it's, it's a tension I guess we observe here. So this brings me to the end of the talk, um, where I thought, so where, where do I see more questions raising or ethical issues that might be also interesting? Oh, no, no slide for that. I think the first is that um, in bioethics and, and also polit political ethical theories about patient representations, we have to be aware that we often have particular normative assumptions associated with disease and illness, like regarding the capacity, competencies, um, experience patients have. And I think this needs always empirical validation. Uh, so I think we have to go back, so to say, to, to the patient organizations as well to, to perhaps uh, medical sociological or medical anthropological literature to really understand what is currently at stake with these patients. Um, a second point, um, I thought, because you also mentioned that you are also working with patient organizations, I think that uh, these different types of representation might also challenge our own research practice. I mean, I'm addressing here myself because we collaborate with, with, um, with patient organizations in a couple of research projects. Who do we, so to say, really approach as patients? And how do we select these, these representatives? Um, and that there are already um, in, uh, ethical pre-assumptions where the conflict is or what are the moral issues at stake. And as the analysis of the case of patients with dementia showed, there are a lot of uh, also ethical issues arising on, 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 a, on the conflict line between the caretakers and the patients. That regards questions of, um, I think in many cases I think caretakers are wonderful and they do a great job, don't get me wrong, but th there are a lot of cases where caretakers to prioritize their own interests uh, with regard to financial issues, with regard to housing decisions, with regard to, um, there was one, I mean, very exceptional case about the question about sexuality between a woman and her husband and, and how the daughter interfered here. Um, so that's one example. Another example is in many cases where patient organizations are very active, like in the area of prenatal testing or pre-implantation diagnostics. I mean, there is this kind of tension between the interest of the parents and the children. And I think that's, that's a really interesting question is who do we cooperate then in these research projects if we want to be perhaps ethically balanced. Um, it might be not always possible, so to say, to bring in the children's perspective. Um, but at least we should be aware that some patient organizations already um, pre or, or, or shape, so to say, the ways, what, what type of access, what, what, to what kind of experience we do have access to. And as I already said, I think this is observation, it's more like a STS um, um, assumption I have here, it's an observation, but I think it's very important for bias to realize that there is a kind of co-production of new, tech, new, new modern technologies in diagnostics uh, and the idea who is a patient and what is how we classify patients and that's I think a quite tricky system we cannot really escape, but I think we also have to be critical towards the fact that more and more people are now classified as patients or, or patients in wait or patients at risk. Um, but what does this mean for the quest of, of, of patient representation and PPI? 
I think in practice we try now, we, we, we draw the own conclusion for our research project that we try in the new projects. For example, when we collaborate with um, on, on topics of dementia, we normally only collaborate with one patient organization in Germany. We realized after our own study, okay, that's a problem, so we might have to include a couple of patient organizations to cover these different perspectives. So the idea is not to criticize patients organizations as such or to reject the idea, but rather to ensure pluralism um, in, in these type of representative practices. And I see that partiality in advocacy is an issue, especially if we, for example, use patient organizations or interviews or focus groups or surveys with patients to gain new insights, what patients have for interest, and perhaps we want to build in this in our ethical theories and claims. So I think the partiality of these patient organizations is something we cannot really circumvent. I think it's, so to say, built in the system. I think and the only way how we can deal with it is to have a more deliberative understanding of how to deal with um, these perspectives. If we just aggregate perspective as, as I think, couple simplistic understanding of utilitarian uh, interest aggregation might assume just we do a survey and if 70% think this is important we just go for that so to say I think then we of course have a serious problem with partiality but if we uh, rather understand it as something that is natural to the idea of interest but then we allow a process that's open for uh, deliberation and critical reflection of our arguments, I think it's not really a problem. Okay, so here I end. This is uh, literature I mentioned. I like to mention uh, my colleagues Aviad, Nitsan and Karin, you already met. And I'm also grateful for the funding for this particular project and also the funding of the German Research Council made it possible that I'm now here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Silke. From my perspective, this was so incredibly rich that I have 2,000 questions. <laughs> so I'll shut up <laughs> and uh, invite everybody else to, to come into the conversation. So I'm interested in differences in modes of political engagement between mm -hmm. the different countries that you've looked at. I know when I was doing um, my research in Italy, there was a lot more hesitancy, I felt, mm -hmm. to get involved with anything that looked like it was political advocacy or you know involvement in, in planning things or making things happen, like more of a deference to other types of expertise. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Epstein's work on HIV AIDS activism, um, which many people have written about being really grounded in sort of US political models. Mm -hmm. Did you find uh, any differences in, in those sorts of models between uh, Germany and Israel or the other mm -hmm. places where you've worked that might inform like who's involved, who's doing the representing and what their motivations are to start being a patient representative. Yeah. Very good point. Um, very difficult question too. <laughs> I, I think, long, I, I think <laughs> first of all, I think, it ha I think there are two, I mean, we can historize or we can try to historize the, the, this phenomenon. And I think one, I think there, there are two strands that might have a role to understand a bit the cultural differences. And the, I think the one is how cultures, I mean, national cultures, um, um, have what, what type of democratization, so to say, what kind of political culture do they have? Is it a very polarized version? Or is it a very deliberative one? Or, I mean, a very moderate one? I think that that's something we need to understand, but we also have particularly to understand how the medical and healthcare system is politicized in these countries. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I can say is I think what Israel and Germany share, for example, is even if there are a lot of differences in the way how I think political culture works, is that they have both a health policy which is from the beginning very expert dominated. So but who is an expert? That differs, for example. In the Israeli system, we found 
uh, our impressionism, it's very difficult to generalize it about, uh, um, for all areas in healthcare, but it's often that really the medical experts are really dominating and, and seen also as those in charge in, in case there is a conflict. In the German system, it's, it's the legal expert. So it's often that, then, for example, just take the case of end-of-life decisions. In Israel, you're in the hospital or you go to abortion um, decisions. I mean, in Israel, it's normally a committee of doctors. You have to bring forward the case and then they decide. In Germany, it's always a, um, a committee where a lawyer or a legal expert is, so to say, leading this committee. Mm -hmm. Um, so in this sense, I think we, we can observe that there are um, different cultures regarding what kind of expertise is more prioritized. And I think this has also then consequences for opportunities of public involvement. Mm -hmm. I think in, in the case, I would say in Israel you see where doctors have um, close collaboration with patient organizations. There, you see that there's also more openness to the idea to bring in patients. Mm -hmm. While uh, legal experts not in Germany, they have a long-standing mistrust to the public as such, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, particular, and to particular interest groups for um, and special. So, so I think there are cases, and uh, but what is the section of herbs for the for the German system is the so-called Krüppelbewegung, which was a disability movement in the 70s and 80s, who was very very strong, and 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 this has somehow this shows more parallels, interestingly, to the U.S. Mm -hmm. So the, I think the, this, this movement, um, this, this particular disability movement, has really opened up um, a space in Germany for patient organizations that, that perhaps wouldn't have been there otherwise. And the second point is the Germans have a really I mean, a tremendous historical tradition in so-called associations, like a, a, how do you say, um, um, what's the English term? I mean, notice associations. They talk about it in Italy as well. Yeah, it's so the idea like is everybody. So the <laughs> association is from your local <laughs> soccer club yep. up to whatever you do on hobby in, in your time. Um, you are always in a club, you know? And yes. this club has kind of social engagement idea. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm thinking of. I think in the U.S. Yeah. it's a lot the same way. Exactly. But I grew up in the U.S., so yeah. being trained from elementary school, like, don't you want to be the president of this club? Exactly. Or do this or do that, so there's a lot of pull to yeah. be in an association. Yeah. So these associations, on the other hand, have a very strong social role in the German system. And that's, mm -hmm. again, that's why the patient or, um, organizations who are seen as true associations and not funded by um, pharmaceutical industry or, by, uh, or founded by professionals, have quite a social recognition for these reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, once it, you, it turns out that the, this patient organization is on a pay list, and for example mm -hmm. in Germany it's mandatory to be transparent about that, mm -hmm. I think that, that the public recognition changes. But as it, so in this sense, and we have a lot, of, I mean, the Germany, I, I, I forgot the number, it's over thousands of patient organizations we have, I mean, covering the whole spectrum. So. And also the social um, security or social security system requires that a small portion, it's not a lot of money, but they get money from the public health insurance funds. The organizations? The organizations. If they, um, so to say, um, ensure that it's only like a public um, association and so on. And so I think in this sense, this all plays a role, whether there is a social recognition of, of this type of association. Uh, and um, it's true that the doctors might be still a bit hesitant, but I know, for example, a couple of legal experts who are in favor of patient participation. Mm -hmm. um, and so in German, they often bring forward the arguments. I would also, so to say, bring forward, and, and I think this changes the, um, the mindset, perhaps. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's one explanation. But, but I think also the US case of Epstein shows for me, I mean, it was very radical how the activists <laughs> acted there. 
And in this sense, it polarized the whole, I mean, also the, 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 the activists versus the doctors and the doctors' communities with themselves. And I think this is, for me, as an outsider, typical US politics. I mean, you have two camps, and then you fight, and perhaps at the end you find a solution. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Does it make sense? Yes, thank yes. you so much. <laughs> I would have a question in there. Ken Gaudi, I'm from the Arthritis Society uh, here in, the, in Montreal. Uh, we're a pan Canadian organization um, representing, so working for patients. Um, and um, yes, we're receiving pharma funding for education material less than 5%. Mm -hmm. Full disclaimer here. Uh, but how do you see the evol evolution of the uh, the insight that patient organization for and of patient mm -hmm. could bring in the the new political environment or in the research or um, as most of them uh, most of us mm -hmm. actually are working more and more together in a and then an integrated fashion um, we have an arm. Uh, which is the uh, CAPA, it's a Canadian, pan, uh, the uh, Pan-Canadian Association of uh, Arthritis Patients, mm -hmm. which is an or or organization of mm -hmm. patients, and we're uh, sharing mm -hmm. interests, model of uh, government and so on. Mm -hmm. So we're working closely together to promote better insights. So one more pro Professional, if we would like to say, and one more grassroots. So those situations are coming, at least in the Canadian environment, more and more frequent. So how do you see that evolve, evolution coming, and how can um, decision maker uh, be more interested by us? So the first question was about. Um about the collaboration between often for patient organizations. And I think this is a very important point, but it might require that both groups share at least some basic assumption regarding what is this the illness about, what is the disease conception. And that's why I pointed to the problem of the person with autism. There you really find kind even I couldn't overstress it, but you can say it's a kind of war between these patient or groups because the um, patient organization four, which is often a parent um, organization, they really have a, um, they, they really rely on the biomedical understanding of autism, while at least some of these other groups say we are not patients at all. And this is uh, we are, this is the whole idea of having just um, um, uh, neural pluralism and, and people have a different way to think about uh, things. And they, they think that this patient organizations um, for really, um, how to say, um, invade or even dominate in a very problematic way the biomedical and, and healthcare discourse. So here I think we, that I, I wouldn't see a collaboration at all, <laughs> and which is a challenge, but I think it's very important to understand that both perspectives have something to do with a very problematic, I mean very difficult at least, conception of a disease like autism, which is in itself I think a very um, broad spectrum. So with arthritis it might be um, less problematic, and I think it's very good to have both perspectives um, be involved. Still, I think the question is, why do you still have so many non-affected persons being represented in this patient organization? What is their interest about? And I think creating transparency about these um, interests is very, very important for the social recognition of these organizations. And the more you create transparency and also create justification, and good arguments, good reasons are for that, I think the more perhaps politicians will also listen to it. Um, yeah, that's, I think there's often a lot of, it's often that these organizations are black box, you know, there's one person and these persons are like the expert patient and they travel from one meeting 
but you have never seen the rest of the community. Mm. And I think this creates also a lot of mistrust, for good reasons or bad, but I think it, it's something organizations have to be aware of. I mean, it's, I think the same with political parties. If there's only one person all the time talking, you also ask yourself, what is the political community behind that? Yeah. So I would avoid an authoritarian style. So, following up on Anne's uh, question, uh, I represent the Breast Cancer mm -hmm. Foundation here in Quebec. And uh, it's a very interesting talk. We're starting uh, the patient advocacy mm -hmm. uh, program at the foundation. It's relatively new on learning. So, I'm just trying, first question, the identity of my foundation. Is it for or off? Because we have a community of patients, mm -hmm. we work with them, uh, we meet with them regularly. But at the same time, it's led by professionals, like I'm a professional, mm -hmm. I'm not a patient. Uh, the president is a, is a professional as well. And um, so now we're being involved in these advisory meetings, policy uh, making advisory committees, and I'm representing them. So do you mm -hmm. think I am an off or a for organization? So I'm like for them, I'm trying, you know, it's yeah. for the patients, but... I mean, according to our categorization, it would be still a for okay. organization, because I think that that's why it comes to the question of representation. The front person is really important. If you would change your, like, the, 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 the directorium of your organization, and you would include one or two persons who are themselves had, like, survivors. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that would change the perception and that would also, I, I, and this person is allowed to speak and not only the professionals. I think that's the point is that when professionals speak, I mean they still pay into the hegemony of the expert discourse. Okay. And, and the question is also of course, the second point is what type of, that's, I didn't dig into that, but we were also interested what type of democratic structures do these organizations have. Do you have internal consultations? Mm -hmm. Do you just have an, a small advisory board and then one director? And and you rarely do you talk once a year on an annual meeting with the patients as members? Or is the idea that you have regular consultation groups and our board? Mm -hmm. Our board are all has to be touched by breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So either they were patients survivors mm -hmm. or the husbands of women who passed away from mm -hmm. breast cancer. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, it's kind of an interesting, uh, like, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. My second question is, um, do you, like, so these two models, the off and the for, and what was the most successful in actually making a change and mm -hmm. like policy change in, in the government? Is it like the off or the for? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, just spontaneously, I would say, I mean, think about the disability movement. I think it's the off. I mean, I think the, the off, I mean, show, show what has changed in the last 20 years so regarding legal rights, uh, regarding um, this perspective to disability rights. Um, I think that was more convincing to have people being themselves disabled and going on the streets and raising their own voice than having parents talking and showing um, their children. So I think that's still a successful model, I would say. Or the, the HIV activists, I think this was also good. And I mean, this constituted a particular group. I mean, these were young, highly educated men. So they were already privileged, so to say. That was a criticism, of course. People would say this is not a role model for all kind of patient organizations. But I think um, if, if you are from a political perspective, I think the off model is perhaps more successful. Mm -hmm. If you speak an economical reason or perspective, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. if you think about co who's better collaborating and influencing Biomedical research topics. I'm. That would be a new question. I'm not sure. And what about a model where you would have four organizations, but that are leveraging the voice of the patient itself? So mm -hmm. that patient are out there doing 
the spreading the message, mm -hmm. but it is um, the overseeing body is a four organization. So you have the professional structure, mm -hmm. but with the the voice of the patient, the true patient. Yeah, I think mixed models work. The question is, are these patients still involved in tricky health political questions? I mean, I don't know. It's in, in your case, what can be an area that's also internally highly contested, perhaps genetic tests for arthritis or like mm -hmm. rheum arthritis, for example. I, I think there's this development about. I think here it comes who is then involved in making the, the main line in, in policy um, decisions, so to say. How does the patient organization position themselves for a while? And we have patient organization interview who finally said because they were so divided internally about whether in favor or against genetic testing or pre prenatal testing that they finally decided not to have a political mandate at all. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, uh, my question is closely related to uh, what was uh, uh, touched uh, just before. You addressed the issue of the raise of some new categories of mm -hmm. patients. And I would like to hear more about that. And especially, um, as I see it, you have right now something quite new, which is the professionalization of the status of patients. Mm -hmm. And plus the, 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 the work or the profession of mm -hmm. uh, patient representative. Mm -hmm. And so you have uh, a choice between being a representative in a mere stat statistical and descriptive mm -hmm. uh, way. But I guess my, my, my feeling is that that's, that's not the case. Mm -hmm. That's never, or almost never the case. Usually what happens is that you are representative because you've been somehow uh, framed educated mm -hmm. by healthcare providers mm -hmm. and physicians and so forth. So for example in France, and we have uh, something like that in Montreal as well, you have this new uh, Université des Patients, so patients uh, university, mm -hmm. so you can graduate in disease. <laughs> which, which means that uh, being, uh, how can you be uh, a patient representative for example, I'm thinking about chronic disease. Mm -hmm. Can you be a patient uh, representative if you suck at your disease management, <laughs> for example, <laughs> like most mm -hmm. chronic patients mm -hmm. do? I mean, more than a half mm -hmm. of chronic patients are non-observant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you want someone representative of the mm -hmm. patient, you should pick mm -hmm. someone who fails at mm -hmm. managing his, 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 his disease, why what you see during the Congress and um, all the people that are deemed to be um, worthy of being a partner in the conversation with the physicians are the good patients. Mm -hmm. And so they are, yeah. they are ill, but they, they, they do marathons and they, they, they do uh, on the weekend, I mean, they advocate and they, they fundraise and so forth. So, and now they ask for uh, money, which is fair enough. I mean, that's a <laughs> So being, uh, being sick is becoming a profession with degrees and you have this kind of inequalities that were uh, outside of the patient's community and now it's coming inside. Because for example in France, if you want to work uh, in a patient association, just uh, they ask you if you have your uh, expert patient uh, degree, which is something you have to pay for. Wow. Who gives that to you? Uh, that's that's a university that, that was created by a sociologist. An actual university. Yeah, yeah. Université de Patients exists depuis quelques années. Il y en a une à Montréal, puis il y en a une à Paris. C'est siégé par qui Catherine Tourette Purvi. Et à Montréal, c'est Vincent Dumet, patient expert. Patient partenaire. Partenaire. That's a brand. Yeah. 
Ça devient une priorité pour faire quoi encore bah, Si tu veux travailler dans une association de patients en France, euh, des grosses associations te demandent et n'acceptent des participants que s'ils ont fait la formation de patients experts. Mm -hmm. So, and mm -hmm. of course, who deems you uh, an expert or not? Mm -hmm. And the physicians. That, that's a tricky question that I always share with and confront when I'm speaking with my son about um, yeah, about your patient that you are asking to be on panels mm -hmm. or people or expert themselves. Mm -hmm. How can they voice the voice of the lay audience? So that's mm -hmm. that's why I think there is a place for both in re in representation as the expert can fully help the medical team to better address the disease and to educate them on but you also need patient organization to represent a holistic view of, mm -hmm. yes, you know, but you're, the average person will have a literacy of a five grader, so you must address them in that kind of way, because mm -hmm. other side, other ones, they won't understand anything. But I think what you raise is a really interesting development. I think we also have to ask what is behind that idea that patients have to be expert and professionalized and, and what is the whole <laughs> also the, 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 the politics and the economics behind that. I, I think that's a very important question. To my analysis, I think the problem with this professionalization is that it, it still shows that there is an idea that only patients can, so to say, raise their voice in an expert-dominated system or professional-dominated system if they are also professional. So it tells us first, I think, something about the existing asymmetries. Um, um, and I think one question about how you can deal with asymmetries is that you try to raise the one level or you lower the other level. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so it, overall, I think the, the general attempt that patients, if they have the interest and opportunities to professionalize themselves, I wouldn't say it's ethically or morally problematic as such. But what I want to share is, is a, perhaps a kind of concern, is the idea that it, uh, it, it provides us, again, not the true whatever the truth is, but the, the real um, perspective. picture, perspective of the patient. Mm -hmm. Because the question is, what happens during this professionalization? Do they, or is, it, is this professionalization, for example, organized within a biomedical frame, or is it, does it also include ethical, social competences, legal competences? So I think that would be worth to have a closer look on that system. Um, I have heard, I mean, coming, how do you say that, I think I often work with this that the vision for analytical reasons, the expert and the lay and the, the professionals and the patients. I think in practice we see all the time blurring lines I and mean, we see a lot of doctors who in particular setting talk more about their own problems than they talk about professional perspectives and the other way around. Um, I think we cannot really escape these, these categorizations, um, so we have to work with them. But I think it's good to be sensitive how they are built up and what, how they are claimed by normative assumptions, like is it always better to be professional than non-professional? I think most of us think so. <laughs> yeah, and it tells us also about uh, scholars, I mean, yeah, and, and yeah. But I just had a follow-up. Um, um, Concerning uh, the issue of in epistemic injustices uh, committed against patients, I think that you're, of course, perfectly writing the idea that uh, most of these epistemic injustices uh, consist in considering patients are less credible mm -hmm. than what they are. But as I see it, especially with uh, this category of professional slash partner slash expert mm -hmm. patient and so forth is another epistemic injustice uh, that consists in um, considering that since you're uh, ill 
you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, as a matter of fact, the mere fact that you are ill and that you have an experience with uh, living with a disease is supposed to be a source of wisdom. Uh, you have a kind of philosophical spirit. Mm -hmm. You are more lucid about what is the human condition, you Your are inspiration. more... inspiration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The word that... And all their that, things. That's a huge burden to, yeah, yeah. To, to bear for patients as well, because they have a role model to assume. I, yeah. And you don't necessarily want to, <laughs> I mean, to be a role model in yeah. any sense of the yeah. term. You just want to be... Uh, wow. Yeah, just yeah. a nice guy, you know. <laughs> I think there are two problems. I mean, Frigga herself has stated that only that for her it's only injustice if you underrate another person's credibility. I personally think it's a problem, and I've criticized that in her own approach. It's also a problem that you overrate credibility because most of these relationships are, I mean, the idea between the lay and the expert is it's a kind of an underlying power relationship. And if we say it's only a problem to um, underrate, Patients, but it's no problem to overrate professionals. We have not understood that these are depending categories. And in this sense, I would, I think I'm with you to say it's a problem that we overrate perhaps the credibility of professional patients uh, and that we expect too much. My solution to the problem would be always that we need mixed methods. I mean, we cannot just solve all problems by having patient representatives in. We need still social scientists or empirical ethicists doing research and digging out the ambivalencies in practice. So it's not done by having few patient representatives in this and that board. I think that would be my... Because it's an epistemic limitation. Mm -hmm. So that's, we need methodological solutions to the problem. One of the things that jumped out of this discussion and your presentation uh, was stuff that I've seen in the broader literature in bioethics on deliberative democracy and public consultation yeah. and just the notion of representation. And thinking to your, your question right at the beginning of your talk, what's happening in Quebec, it made me think about a change in some of the discourse we've seen about how members of the public participate in expert panels of whatever sort. So. You know, 20 years ago in bioethics, we were so keen on deliberative democracy, we were using it everywhere, and then following on the European experience, there was a recognition that we were asking people of the general public to represent a general public, and we weren't getting representation. What we were getting was interested parties who were, did not represent the public because they were already interested and capable of participating in these scientific deliberative spaces skewed what decision makers were taking because they were essentially getting a very elite educated public participating with other educated elites. So that was one issue. And what we've seen is an entire development around different ways and methodologies to do this in sophisticated fashion. But in terms of its practical application, in Quebec what I've seen is a change in the language from patient representative to patient or public participant. And so, in, I'm thinking of two examples, in research ethics boards and in uh, clinical excellence committees at NINES, which is the Quebec Health Technology Evaluation Group. All of these committees have public participants. They are not representing the public. Mm -hmm. They are a non-scientist, non-expert in a biomedical or scientific sense voice to bring in a non-expert, non-scientific voice. And so the same thing in, in a research ethics board, mm -hmm. these people are often assuming a very important role because they're asking you those stupid questions. The ones that break the group think because they are not part of an established framing of the issue. And so instead of asking people to represent a group, they're asking people to come and be themselves, mm -hmm. but be not part of the group. And so it, it removes some of the burden mm -hmm of having to represent and speak for a group, mm -hmm. which is impossible. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, makes it more clear what the purpose of participation is, which is to help break groupthink by getting out an outside voice. Then obviously you have the challenge of whether a person is professional, making sure that they can actually participate, because 
it's in academic time, it's not on a weekend, so you have these sorts of pragmatic issues. But the change in the way you name what you're expecting of people, from being a representative to being a participant, I think is part of a way of thinking differently about what the expectations are. I fully agree. I think we have had this. Um, German, the Germans are overall very hesitant about the idea of public engagement. <laughs> that is, I think, also um, historical reasons about being not very trustful in the general public <laughs> because of historical reasons. But it also has, as I said, something to do with uh, strong beliefs in the expert system. And we, in, in the few like consensus conferences, I mean, I, I was one um, a leading one on, on genetic testing. Um, we never talked about public representation because it always was the idea it's just a limited number of people and it's more about qualitative contributions mm -hmm. and not about um, representative in a statistical sense, for example, or so on. The problem with the term participation I think what we also now observe is a new way of how this term get be invaded by very simplistic understanding of what, what participation means. I mean, coming from participatory political ethics, we have quite high standards what participation can mean. But now we observe that the whole rhetorics in the new data banks, the P4 medicine participation is now reduced of just please give us your blood and cells. And, and I think that's, that's another interesting uh, counter-movement, uh, I think by, of course, downplaying, and, but it's often framed in the still political rhetorics of political participation. But if you have a closer look, you see it's all about, okay, it's nice to have you on board to, to give your data. And this data can be biomedical data, this can be, of course, also new opinion, but then there's no, how to say, social responsibility to really listen to what you say. And I think that's a bit the downside of playing down the question of representation and participation. Because it, it plays down the responsibility of those who are having this privilege on sitting on these panels. It's still a privilege. Um, and second, um, it also, how to say, it doesn't, so to say, force them to inform themselves So what does other people think about. Perhaps there is this highly aroused teacher and he loves to be on these panels. <coughs> and we don't know whether he really did his homework by talking to other people, for example. <coughs> so I, I see it as Again, it's very ambivalent, I guess, what, what's going on there, yeah. I see that as the question of tokenism. If you see this in yeah. autism yeah. ethics all the time, it's the same people, yeah. like you said, they go to every meeting, yeah. um, and maybe they have like a really strong, but like, idiosyncratic opinion. And, you know. Yeah. Um, we do have a few, anybody else? Um, we have a few more minutes, and I would love to hear more thoughts on the notion of collective rights. So I, I was historicizing this in my head, and I want you to put on your <laughs> bioethicist hat for okay. a second. Okay. And I was thinking, when, when we think about the history, or bioethics as a social movement, it was all about listening to the patient, right? It was, we had paternalism, and now we have patient autonomy. So all, all we did for this world was to put patients' voices at the center, but as individuals, and only about their own health care. And everything that we're talking about today seems like the next... Uh, obvious stage in the evolution of bioethics, the emancipation, that now patients are not just recognized as self-determination for themselves, but as a group and their political representation, etc. Mm -hmm. So philosophically, what are the challenges with seeing uh, patients as a group? So for example, when we, uh, are put, when we want to include patients representation or participation in prenatal context, uh, we're told, okay, ask pregnant women. But a woman's only pregnant for like nine months, then she's no longer pregnant. Uh, is she always a representative because she was once pregnant? Does she have to be like a year out? Of, well, who is in the group? Um, and that includes the issue of being a patient in the making, you know, being at risk, or being a survivor. Um, so this notion of collective identity for patients is so extremely challenging conceptually that I don't even know where to start yeah. when I think about it. 
Um, more general thing I have to say, or perhaps to add, is that the whole idea about collective rights as such is quite contested for a couple of reasons. And that has something to do with the analytical and individualistic tradition in bioethics. I think for most political scientists or po political philosophers, I mean, collective rights are more or less unquestionable, important for politics. But I think bioethics has, because of its analytical tradition and its very individualistic um, tradition, um, never saw the always. I mean, it, it so to say, the idea ideal was to see the patient as individual, and to so to say. I think that historically, I think that has has got a lot of good reasons to put a strong focus on the individual. But on the other hand, as a couple of others have pointed out, I think this has somehow a bit stretched the problem too far in the sense to neglect the social embedding, for example, of patients, first of all. So the idea is, first of all, to have this collectivity can be more general mean to, to be more sensitive to the social embedding, including, for example, when we think about problems, not only about the patient themselves, but also to see the family perspective. And when it comes to reproductive medical decisions, I think it's always interesting. I mean, there, there are feminist arguments in favor of singling out the women's interests. But there can be also very good normative arguments to include the potential child's perspective, like what is about the partner's um, perspective, and so on and so on. And this all would, so to say, already open up a bag of collectivity. So perhaps reproduction is, is, is one of the most pro-social <laughs> activities we can think of. And I think ethicists have failed, so to say, to see this collective dimension for a long time. I think it's changing, but I think it was hard. And then the second point is patients as a group is in particular, as you just revealed, very challenging, but I think historically we were always working with patients or we thought about patients who are chronic. You know. And that's a bit different with women who are just nine months pregnant, where whether they are patients as such, I'm questioning. Uh, but it's so, I think historically, I think the idea with patients as a group I was always about you are, it's not like you just have uh, a nine months illness and then it's over. That we talk about all the diseases who normally are not really curable and even if there is a treatment, the treatment might be really for your life, the rest of your life really high risk and a lot of side effects. So I think that's also the history and the political practice of patient organizations. For example, we tried to find for a couple of research questions we were interested in having patients around um, heart attacks or heart disease. You won't find so many patient organizations because for most people a heart attack is a, um, they don't see themselves as chronic patients. So their, their understanding is normally not, um, it, it makes sense so to say to share the experience. Um, so, but what we would find is cancer, uh, mental um, illness, um, arthritis, um, all the, I mean, all kind of degenerative uh, diseases. Um, but of course, as I said, I mean, this might also change. There are now a couple of, and there are also contested diseases. I mean, social scientists have written about it. There are groups who um, organize themselves as patient groups while the, the medical category of this disease is perhaps not accepted at all. But they feel it, it, that, that's what they fight for, for example, like, like women around endometriosis, what I understood is, is an area where the, a lot of doctors don't see it as a real category of disease, mm -hmm. but it was, uh, or it's also a contribution of, of some groups to make doctors think about it as a disease. So I think what we observe is again a contested field of what consists a group, but as you said, it's not always easy. and. For some groups, it makes more sense to be really seen as a group, but social philosophers wouldn't say, I mean, I would say groups are mainly interesting if there's a kind of stability and collective will building, for example. So for, I would have a kind of a category that just brings 
groups as collective political agents in forefront and would distinguish them to other social groups. Like, like women who go during their pregnancy and of course they build a group for sure. Um, but it's not perhaps a political very important group we, we think about now. Um, because they don't have a joint deliberation about their values and their interests. Except they will found out of that the feminist group for whatever reasons, you know? So, you yeah. know. Um, my question is more like a bit futuristic, but not so much. But like with all the genetic tests that get developed, we can like now be identified early before we're even sick. Mm -hmm. uh, with a potential disease, so like, is there a kind of future of like, I don't know, organization that would be made just for like, because I saw there, they make now like, genetics text $40 and you can know your heart uh, risk, mm -hmm. so like, maybe patient organization won't be like, patient organization, but like, predisposition organization and make like, political um, decisions according to only genetics can. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. I think there are a couple of <coughs> patient organizations where, I mean, you would go on a Huntington disease, for example. You would find people who have been diagnosed, but yet unsymptomatic. But you can say, okay, Huntington has a very high um, prevalence of disease mm -hmm. and so on. But it's true that, like in my own field, bio um, dementia, that's why I came to this, is, is a problem with genetic testing or so-called biomarker testing much earlier, so in an asymptomatic state. And these tests don't tell you you will get it for 100%. Mm -hmm. So it's a risk. But what we observe that some of these patients or these persons tested enter the field and they will speak up as potential patients. And that brings us again to the to the quest: who can they repro yeah. represent? And what expertise do they have? Yeah, so they don't have embodied knowledge yet, or do they? Exactly. So my argument would be: the main problem. I don't see it as a problem as such because it's kind of our biomedical and healthcare reality. And um, but they cannot speak on their own. If they, they have to be backed up deliberately by, by the group, and then it would be okay, you know? I mean, that, that I would always be interested in the way how they are embedded in the whole group's deliberation and consultation, or do you just invite this individual because she or he had this genetic test and then she speaks about dementia? And I think that these are the positions we should be, um, we should problematize about. We just ran out of time and people might have uh, their next uh, scheduled event, so I just want to thank you so much. This I was fascinating you. and touched on something that's relevant to each person around the table. I know that for a fact. <laughs> so thank you thank so you much. much.